Welcome back to Bluegrass this beautiful Sunday afternoon. George and I are out doing a little weed eating and mowing, and uh, we're doing a little black lab therapy with Jinx. And I was on the mower, and uh, the cameraman stopped me, and she goes, hey, Stoney, you ought to make a video about this. And, you know, I thought about uh, the fact that I never that I never let you guys see, like, some of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes when I'm not, like, doing, like, dedicated dog training on the course or on an adventure. Okay, well, here's my big thing, guys, is I think that the best learning uh, is comes from doing, okay? Learning by doing is super important. And a lot of times we miss that fact, especially if we have a dog like Jinx, a Dutch Shepherd, a Malinois, a Belgian Shepherd, a Border Collie, a Blue Heeler, okay? These dogs are so good at doing stuff, a lot of times that when they're puppies, you spend an inordinate amount of time teaching them to heal and look up at you and roll over and catch frisbees and do stuff, and you don't spend quite enough time just learning how to live, okay? And my theory on obedience is basically that you need enough obedience to go out into the world and let the world teach your dog how it ought to act in most situations, okay? And then once you get that knocked out and this, and you can go back to, to, to teaching it anything you want, okay? Once a dog will come when you call it and be still when you tell it and has good manners from your neighbor's perspective, well then, listen, you got to, you got all of the rest of the dog's life to work on doing like cute, cute behaviors, right? But it's that stuff that happens, like music is in between the notes. Dog training is in between the dog training exercises. And that's why I hate it when people are talking about train your dog in five minutes a day or five easy steps to a trained dog those that's none of that's true okay having a good dog comes from living and putting the dog in a wide range of situations and environments and so what was going on right there that the cameraman wanted me to show you guys is I'm just riding a mower and George is weed eating and we're fixing to go out back and finish a picnic table that we started yesterday and uh, the cameraman is uh, you know making Jinx kind of tag along and get acclimated to all this stuff just so we can take the leash off of Jinx and let Jinx do whatever he wants, okay? So I have a dog that comes here from Chicago. The people that own Jinx, uh, they don't mow their own yard. <laughs> I actually don't work for anybody that mows their own yard, but I mow my own yard, okay? But the dog's gonna be around people that mow yards. The dog's gonna be around tutors. The dog's gonna be around house painters. It's gonna be around working guys like me. And he can't just be going around and like barking and growling at everybody and biting somebody that doesn't look like his family. He has to be exposed. He has to have real life experience. And that real life experience does not come from telling him to sit or lay down or roll over or high five or jump into the heel position and stare at the owner. I do not want the dog to stare at me when I'm out socializing them for living real life because if the dog's staring at me, how in the world is he learning anything about how to navigate a real life environment? He's not, okay? So this is how we do it. We come out, we do our formal school work in the morning, okay? And then we start in doing whatever socialization or in Jinx's case, remedial socialization that we need to do just by dragging him around. We call that bum training. Okay, now around here, we ain't no bums, are we, George? We work, we work all day, every day, seven days a week. If the day ends in Y, you can find me working, right? Okay, so uh, we'll call it workman training, right? Okay, Jinx is learning how to get out and put in that steady work all day long about learning, like, about living life, okay? And so Jinx has had a pretty good, uh, he's had a pretty good reaction to the mower and the four-wheeler and the uh, weed eater. First first couple of times that we did this with him, he wanted to chase and bite uh, the mower and chase and bite the weed eater, but he's getting pretty chill. Did a little pre-fatiguing with him. So I'm just gonna take his leash off and uh, then I'm gonna go back to mowing and I'm gonna let him go back to palling around with these black labs and George is gonna go back to weed eating. Then we're gonna go out back and we're gonna take a little hike and we're gonna work on building a picnic table and then we're gonna build a fire, okay? In other words, we're just gonna live uh, a life that gets Jinx in touch with his roots. What are these Dutch Shepherds, Malinois, Belgian Shepherds, Kelpies, Blue Heelers, what are they really? Okay, they're really farm dogs, okay? And even though you guys are living in the suburbs or, or you're living this fantasy of chasing bad guys down and chasing, you know, and biting on them or whatever, okay? The, the reality is that they're farm dogs. And if you want them to learn best, help them get in touch with their farm dog roots and then like everything else will take care of itself over time, I promise you. All right, so you guys can just tag along with us for the rest of the day, and we won't bore you and videotape it all, but we'll videotape segments, and hopefully this will inspire you to get your farm dog out and do some farm dog living.
we're going to ride around, make sure these dogs get just a little bit tired and make it a lot easier to uh, build our picnic table and work on our fire. Okay, so I'm gonna let you guys in on a little extra secret pro tip. If you're gonna have a pack of mentor dogs, you have to have a few females, because if you don't, when you come out with the young, super athletic male dogs like Jinx, they just kind of blow you off. He's like, look, old man, I got things to do. I'm, I'm young and full of energy. I'm gonna go off exploring. And I'm like, are you sure you wanna do that? He's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I said, hey, all the girls hang out with me. And he says, oh, good point. I'll hang out with you too, Uncle Stoney. Let's go, come on, Annie. And look, you can see him following Annie around right there. So as long as I can control Annie, I can control Jinx. Come on, dogs. Very nice. So Annie goes somewhere. Come on, Jinx. Come on, Annie. So here comes Annie. And uh, here comes Jinx. Super simple, guys. No reason to reinvent the world in life. Just find something that dogs like and control it. Okay, so now we're over here at uh, George's picnic table project. George is quite the handyman. Any of you ladies out there looking for an awesome wrestler slash uh, construction worker slash uh, scholar, <laughs> George, send them your number. Uh, we'll post it on the screen later. <laughs> All right. Now, so we always try to, you know, multitask as much as possible around here. So we're gonna build a fire, okay? Yeah, building a fire serves a couple of uh, purposes. Number one, since we're always trimming up limbs and stuff out here, we like to keep the place clean, and uh, so we you know, like to burn that debris. But number two, we like to do campfire safety training a lot of times while the dogs are here because of most of the people that uh, come hang out with us, uh, they like to do outdoor stuff, you know? So you can kind of see uh, we got a whole, got a whole little fire pit, oh, full of uh, brush here from cleaning up our picnic area. So I'm going to start a little fire, and uh, then uh, Charlotte will tend the fire, and I'll go over there and help George. And then this whole time, basically, what we're doing with Jinx is we're just letting them soak up life, you know. And this is filling in all the cracks and crevices that formal training miss. Okay, and I just, I can't stress that to you guys enough. Just, you know, coming out and uh, like just being out here in the woods, uh, going on a nice run. Now, you know, the, the run serves two purposes. Number one, I'm getting some socialization in. Uh, number two, you know, I'm getting Jinx used to coming back to the whistle because whenever I whistle, then Andy comes back. And so Jinx is like, oh, whistle, Andy's going back? Well, I'll go back too, so that's pretty cool. Uh, we're gonna work on manners because here in a little while, while George and I are using the saw, uh, I'm gonna make Jinx kind of be still and stay out of the way so that, it, you know, he doesn't get, uh, doesn't get himself in any trouble while we're really focused uh, on building the rest of the table. Uh, the dog's going to learn about the, you know, the sensory experience of being around a campfire, which for dogs like uh, Dutch Shepherds, Malinois, you know, one of the things you'll notice about them, and it's just every, they're just everything's a big deal to them, you know. And that's the thing with the mower. When the mower first started, it was a big deal to Jinx. You know, first time he saw a stroller, it was a big deal. First time he saw a wheelchair, it was a big deal. First time somebody new came into his house, it was a big deal, so he bit him on the butt. You know, <laughs> like everything's a big deal to him. And it's not just Jinx, it's almost all of them, guys. So what all of this really is about, it's about coming out here and making sure that they have enough experience to really understand what's a big deal and what's not a big deal. 
okay? And that especially goes for dogs that are bought with the intention of being a little bit of a protection dog, right? It's no good to go out of the house with a dog that doesn't understand what a threat is and what a threat isn't. If you have a protection dog and you have to tell them, who to protect you against, you're already behind the eight ball. So that's not gonna really help you, you know? And if you have a protection dog that don't, doesn't know who, who's a threat and who isn't a threat, well then now all that is a liability and you can't have any fun when you take them out because you gotta worry, you gotta hold them on a leash real tight, you gotta keep a muzzle on them. I mean, that's no good. You know, and so we're about 360 degree wins here. So we want to make sure Jinx has a good time. We want to make sure his owners have a good time. And we want to make sure we keep all the people that Jinx and his owners come in contact with safe. Okay, so now we're going to get to building this fire and finishing this picnic table and letting these dogs run around. And uh, we'll just kind of give you a little footage of what it looks like to learn by doing. All right, cameraman, show them what those dogs are doing over there. Now guys, I could tell you that those dogs are over there laying down and being still because I'm such an excellent trainer. <laughs> but the bottom line is they're laying over there being really good because they're tired, okay? So you don't have to be an awesome trainer to have a dog that minds super well at the campsite or at the work site. You just have to be willing to put a little work in uh, before you get really busy, okay? So we went ahead and we rode them around, we made them super tired, and now we're gonna build a fire, and then I'm gonna go over there and I'm gonna help George with the, with the uh, picnic table while Charlotte watches the dogs and make sure nobody uh, gets their nose uh, in the fire. Okay, Charlotte, come over here and let's show them how we build a fire. Okay, so first things first, um, what are the three things that you need to have a fire? Oxygen, fuel, spark. Oxygen, fuel, and spark. Okay, back up over here just a little bit, Charlotte, so they can see. Okay, guys, now listen. I like 360 degree winds. I say that all the time in all the videos. Okay, this is a perfect example. I'm out with my daughter. We're gonna work on a essential survival skill, which is building a fire. I'm gonna get some campfire safety in. I'm making a video, and I hope you guys like it. George and I are doing a picnic table, so when people come down here, I can bring them out and fix them bologna and tomato sandwiches. <laughs> I mean, it's just a, just a super night, isn't it, Charlotte? Yeah. Okay, but we need to learn. We need to be learning all the time, and so kids need to learn that there's three components to a fire, which are? Oxygen, fuel, and spark. Oxygen, fuel, and spark. Now. If you want to be super successful uh, when you go do your campfire safety training with your children, uh, stop by a construction site and just pick you up a few scraps of dry wood, okay? Just kiln dried lumber makes it really easy to start a fire. If you're out here, <laughs> hey, how good does uh, just the, the kind of wood you find uh, laying around, how good does that burn? It's not very well at all, okay? So when you watch people do bushcraft and stuff, and they're just randomly picking up things and cooking their, their twigs, there's a little bit, little bit of fudging on that, okay? Uh, so you gotta work your way up in terms of fire starting a building, okay? So first thing is knowing uh, what makes a fire, which is? Oxygen, fuel, and spark. Okay, then you gotta have a method of starting a fire. Now what method do we use? Log cabin. Log cabin method, okay. So what we do is we take, and uh, we take for our advanced fire starters, uh, we go collect some hardwood and uh, we break things up. And if, if it doesn't snap, put it back. So that's for your advanced fire starters, right? You don't you don't cheat and take uh, kiln dried lumber if you're an advanced fire starter. But for our beginner fire starters, uh, we just come out here and we take some lumber and we cut it into little pieces. And those pieces are what sizes? Pencil lead, pencil finger, thumb. Pencil lead, pencil finger, thumb. Okay, which goes first? Pencil lead. Pencil lead, that's right. So what I like to do is I like to build me a little bit of kind of a floor uh, uh, for my fire to start on. Okay, so now what I'm going to do here, um, another super simple thing for you parents out there who want to go out with your kids and have them be successful at building fires. What's that, Charlotte? A Vaseline soaked cotton ball. A Vaseline soaked cotton ball. Hey, this works really good for catching a spark and starting a fire. So put that in the middle of our fire floor. Now we're going to take and build a... Log cabin. Log cabin, right? Okay. So Charlotte's gonna, oh, well, you gotta make a support on this side, and then there you go. Okay. Cameraman, what were those blocks that we used to play with when we were kids? Lincoln logs. Lincoln logs. Uh, listen, I'm showing my age there, guys. But if your children do not have Lincoln logs, uh, you're doing them a disservice, right? Okay, so get them some Lincoln logs, and that'll help them to be able to come out here and uh, build a log cabin fire. Okay, so we're just gonna get that up there just a little bit. And then um, what happens is I take my little cotton ball and I get it up here. Now this is where the pencil leads are gonna come in handy. All right, so get your pencil leads ready. And as soon as this cotton ball catches a, catches a spark, okay, then you're gonna do what? Um, Start feeding it, it. yep. 
Now, here's the key with this, guys. You take your, take your, if you're using a magnet, this is just a cheap one from Walmart, uh, really, which is a ferrocerium rod, but I was teaching Charlotte about magnesium blocks. Okay, this will work all right. So I'm gonna take this, hold this steady, and pull the, Pull the strike, uh, pull the hold the striker still, pull the magnesium block and the ferrocerium rod, and then we start feeding the fire pencil lead, pencil, finger, thumb. So here's some little shavings and some little bitty pieces. Now, look, you see how that just, just caught fire, right? I mean, it's like perfect, it looked awesome, didn't it? Uh, that's not going to happen if you guys don't take you a little bit of dry wood. <laughs> so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna tell you that, okay. You'll be out there feeling like a like a bad parent because you're at the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts and you can't build your fire, okay? That's because you didn't plan right. <laughs> Being successful is all about playing uh, with the, you know playing the odds to your favor. The log cabin's burning down. The log cabin's doing awesome. Okay, now once this starts going, okay, then we can start thinking about uh, just getting uh, various types of wood off of the forest floor and what's even better guys find you some dead wood that's up on a tree and uh, that kind of wood is it's not been soaking up uh, you know water from the from the ground okay charlotte go over there and get a few i'm gonna stay with you for just a second cameraman back back up over there and show them uh, what a good job i've done of training these dogs yeah you probably want to go the other way There you go. That way the sun's behind you and you can see what they're really doing. They're just kind of casually over there watching. And I'm gonna grab a few limbs here and help Charlotte get started. And then we'll go help George. And we'll switch from campfire safety to workplace safety. That I'm a big proponent of. I don't want any dogs going into the workplace and not being safe. All right, now we're going to switch from a log cabin to a what, Charlotte? Teepee. To a teepee. Once we get us a good little amount of flame going, we can just kind of start. Now, that one was a little big. You had to, you had to, you had to put small ones on there first. It takes a long time for the fire to get hot enough for the big ones. So you take some. There you go. Build your little frame. That one's a little too long, so we'll break him. Now, did you hear that crack, right, that snap? If, it's, if it snaps, it's usable. What do you do if it doesn't snap, Charlotte? Put it back. Put it back, that's right. Now, a lot of you guys, with your dog training or your kid raising, you're always thinking about the negative. You're thinking about, well, you know, I'm gonna do it for them. I'm gonna lift them and get them in the car. I'm gonna. You know, uh, if it's a child, I'm going to build a campfire for them. <sighs> Look, guys, your brain is a sponge. I mean, Charlotte's brain is so much better than my brain nowadays uh, that all I have to impart to her is experience, okay? Like, w with the dogs, like, say, No Name's age, I mean, his, he, you know, he, No Name's an awesome dog, and he knows a lot of things, you know, but he doesn't learn like he learned when he was uh, 16 weeks old. You know, I mean, No Name and I both are already starting to forget things that we knew last year, you know. <laughs> Is that right, Charlotte? Yeah. How often do I forget something? You have to remind me. Um, maybe every week. Maybe every week, <laughs> right? And then it just gets worse, guys. I mean, uh, you know, the only thing uh, worse than getting old is not getting old, you know. So teach your puppies, teach your children young, you know, give them as much life experience as possible. And the more life experience you give them, then like uh, the better they're going to be at learning and adapting to situations. Um, and that's really the key here with all of this. And this is my point with the dogs is, you know, dogs come here for training. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty good dog trainer. I'm competent. I mean, that's really the starting point with hiring a dog trainer. Okay. Are they competent? Uh, will they do the work? And I will, you know, but I don't want to oversell what I do. Um, you know, as far as my dog training skills, you know, my skills lie in dog management. You know, I put dogs in lots of situations. I'm just willing to spend more hours than most people doing it. Uh, I'm willing to, you know, spend more of my weekends making sure I have enough income to, um, uh, you know, maintain my facilities. Because ultimately, you know, I could be as well-intentioned as I want. If I didn't have this facility, uh, I, you know, I couldn't do this stuff. Okay, so there's a lot of factors that go into your dog training besides just your talent. 
you know, or your passion. A lot of it just boils down to getting out and putting the work in. Okay, Charlotte, I'm going to get a few more sticks for you, and then I want you to start uh, picking some pretty good sized sticks over here and keeping our TP going, and we're going to go check on George. We'll probably end up getting this fire big enough so that we can burn even these old grapevines uh, that we put over here yesterday. Guys, we're at war with brush honeysuckle everywhere and grapevines. It's crazy how many grapevines have in, invaded my property. I don't even know where they came from. But they, they climb up on all my trees and then they kill them. So we come out here and we try to, to we try to have battle with them, don't we, Charlotte? And then we burn them. Plant okay. Wars. Plant wars. That's exactly right. Okay, so the dogs are up because uh, they know I'm fixing the head over here. So let's head over here and uh, see what George is up to. Hey, Dad. Yeah. Which braces, buddy? The braces for the benches. Oh, well, I just put those there temporary. We can put them wherever you want to. I was thinking we might move them back up over here. Okay, okay now, so you see, like, we went from a campfire safety training session to a workplace uh, training session, uh, all in a matter of about uh, 40 steps, right? Maybe not even that many. Uh, now, I realize that not a lot of you go camping, okay, uh, or don't go camping all the time. And not a lot of you necessarily uh, even do a lot of home improvement projects, but a lot of you do have home improvement projects done, okay? And so this is super important. Hear this noise? <laughs> That's the kind of noise that like startles and surprises dogs. And so if you have a dog like Jinx, uh, listen, if he's never heard those kind of noises before and all of a sudden you have strange people in the house and uh, maybe, they're, maybe they're talking in a language that uh, is not normal in the home environment, okay? Maybe their mannerisms are a little bit different than what uh, they, they run into in their normal uh, course of uh, social interaction, okay? That adds a lot of stress, okay? And that stress manifests itself in threat displays and sometimes just out and out violence, okay? So that's another thing that we're doing. I just can't stress enough to you how important it is to think about all the situations your dog might find themselves in. And although dogs don't generalize well, okay? In other words, they don't like go from one situation to the next and go, oh, I see where this is similar. They do generalize, okay? And so like, let's say that they're not very good at it, but just like you, if you're not very good at something, but you tr practice all the time, then you end up being good at it, okay? So although it might be hard for, a, for the uh, dog to go from understanding that the saw, Got to be smarter than the saw, right? Okay, so like here we have circular saw, a little bit different. Jigsaw, a little bit different. Little drill driver, okay? So all these things are a little bit different, okay? And after the dog has enough experiences, back up a little bit, uh, cameraman, and show them. After a, dog, after a dog has enough experiences, everything kind of starts to look the same to them. So we have a big four-wheeler and a little four-wheeler, and we have a little uh, motorcycle, okay? I know some of you guys would call that uh, a moped. <laughs> Don't give me a hard time, right? Um, now, uh, also what we're gonna do tonight, we're gonna do a little bit of shooting, okay? We're gonna do quite a bit of limbing, Okay, so again, just we're after just as much exposure as what we can possibly get in as short a period of time as we can while Jinx is still in a relatively formative time of his life. And hopefully when we send him home, he will have the ability to process information a lot better and he'll have a greatly expanded understanding of what constitutes, uh, you know, threats. Okay, because guard dogs, protection dogs, they're really of no value if they don't have a perception of vulnerability and if they don't understand when threat displays uh, and violence are appropriate or inappropriate. Okay guys, so I hope uh, that this little insight into how my training day's going when I'm not just doing like training on the course or, or doing adventuring, you know, I hope, this, uh, I hope this makes you feel good about your ability to be a really good dog trainer because all it takes to really be a super good dog trainer uh, is time and effort. You know, what I tell people when they email me, I say pick a methodology and implement the methodology with patience, with 
consistency and with most importantly persistence okay and pretty much it all works if you'll just put the time in and uh and and, and you keep moving forward okay? you don't need a lot of progress you just need a little bit of progress every week and every week try to broaden the amount of life situations that you put your dog into and then by the time they're a year or two old they've seen everything okay and you can go wherever you want you can go to alaska or mexico or yosemite or new york city if for some reason you wanted to go up there all right guys i will see you all next week